Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's so wonderful to be in a room like this of clearly very smart, clearly very nice, clearly very generous, because I get a round of applause before I even start speaking. Clearly very educated, because this is, let's face it, a slightly geeky conference. But most of all, people who would rather sit in a windowless room talking about these kinds of things on a nice sunny day than be out there on a nice sunny day, which means that you are probably all exactly the kind of people that the public imagines would be fact checkers. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Um, one day we think computers might be fact checkers too, and over the next half hour or so I'm going to tell you a bit about um, what fact-checking what fact we are currently able to get computers doing. Um, but let's start by thinking about fact-checking itself as a task and see if we can um, get a handle on actually what do humans do when they do fact-checking and how does that relate to what computers might be able to do. So let me start by asking you a very simple question. And it's a hot day, and it's been a long day, and I'm the penultimate talker, so I won't make this too hard for you. I'll, I'll make it really easy, in fact. I'll let you round your answers to the nearest 100 billion pounds. All of you have heard politicians, journalists, and others saying, this will cost the economy a billion pounds. This will add a billion pounds to the economy. Is that a big number? Would you all stand up, please? Yeah, go on. Audience participation straight off the lunch. Let's rock it. Um, everybody stand up. Thank you very much. OK, the simple question is this. How big is the UK's economy to the nearest 100 billion pounds? How big is it? So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to start from zero, and I'm going to ask you to sit down when you think I've got to the size of the UK's economy is. Everyone clear on that? So if you think that the UK's economy is zero pounds in size, please sit down now. This is the sum of everything sold in the UK over the last year. OK, not zero. OK, 100 billion pounds? Sit down if you think that's the size of the UK's economy. 200 billion, 300 billion, 400 billion. First couple of people have started to go. 500 billion, that's half a trillion pounds. A few more heads going, but 600 billion, 700 billion, 800 billion, 900 billion. I think we're about a third of the way through the crowd now. One trillion pounds gets us to about half. You say it with the right emphasis, a few more people go. 1.1 trillion, 1.2 trillion, 1.3 trillion, 1.4 trillion. I think we're down to the last fifth or so. One and a half trillion pounds. 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. 1 half a dozen left standing. Two trillion pounds. 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. 3 Three people left standing. Oh, 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 no, no, you don't get down that easily. Ma'am, what number would you give me? Five point something. Five point something trillion. I saw you, sir, in the blue shirt. I, the, the problem is you haven't defined the size of the economy. So GDP, five, GDP five. last year, total sum of all the goods and services sold in the country. Oh, I don't know, maybe four. Maybe four. And there was someone else standing up here. 3.2. 3 .2. OK. So thank you very much. I appreciate you all joining in. Let me make a really obvious point. Hands up if you felt confident about what the answer was. Hands up if you felt confident about what the answer was and you thought the answer was 1.9 trillion, give or take. OK, about three people in the room. Hands up if you have heard people talking about the size of the economy, a billion quid here. Anybody? Ring any bells? You hear this on the news and stuff? So we hear these claims all the time. But unless we have the context to make sense of them, it's actually impossible to make sensible judgments about does this stack up, does it... Does it mean anything? We don't know what the right answer is, but the right, the right answer to that question is it's about 1.9 trillion pounds. That was GDP, the size of the economy, last year. Um, but without that kind of context, numbers that sound familiar, that sound authoritative, this will cost the economy a billion pounds, are very hard to judge yourself. So one of the things fact checkers do is trying to find context, is to know a lot about where data comes from and be able to apply it to claims as they're coming at us thick and fast. Do any of you watch BBC Question Time or even more geekily Prime Minister's Questions at a Wednesday lunchtime? Oh, you're a lovely crowd. No. Um, <laughs> for people who do, which is about, I think, a million people a week, maybe a couple of million people a week, what you hear is politicians firing claims at each other back and forth. And they all have claims that sound authoritative. Sounds like they must come from somewhere, right? 
So my colleagues are fact checkers at Full Fact, and we're the UK's independent fact checking charities. We spend most of our time actually fact checking. On a Friday morning, we'll be ringing up for people who were on question time the night before saying, you made these claims. We were fact checking live during the program. We tweeted along. We fact checked for claims we saw that we recognized. But you made these new claims that we weren't familiar with. Could you tell us what your source was, please? Could you help us make sense of these? Could you help other people judge them for yourselves? And sometimes you see two people saying the exact opposite of each other. I remember um, Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May, one saying poverty is going up, one saying poverty is going down. Uh, no prizes for guessing which was which. Um, and they both have official statistics on their side. Two different measures of poverty, two different trends. They're both able to say, in some sense, this is correct, which leads me on to what most people think of when they think of automated fact-checking, what particularly computer scientists have really piled in over the last couple of years to try to tackle, which is this question of, can you look at a sentence and decide whether it's true or not? Is that a process that you can automate? Um, and the answer is no, because it's not even a process that humans can agree on. Actually, the world doesn't break down into neat categories of true and false. Most of what we as fact-checkers spend our time doing is trying to explain the shades of gray between the bold and overly simple claims that we hear from campaigners. And they have to be simple claims because they're campaigners and they have a limited amount of time to make their choices. But if you're trying to convince a computer to do this task which has become known as truth labeling, to take individual sentences and assign them a value of true, mostly true, half-half, mostly false or false, that is not a viable task for automation. And this is something that there's now been a couple of very big machine learning contests to uh, prove, that, uh, <laughs> prove that hypothesis exhaustively. One of the problems is there's just not enough data to train on. Um, the data is not easy to get to. The data is not very well structured. But actually, the bigger thing is that truth labeling is simply too difficult a task to have an accepted, correct answer on. So full fact is almost unique among fact-checking organizations in the world in that we don't rate claims on a scale from true to false. We de deliver a conclusion. We deliver links to sources that people can judge for themselves. But we don't believe that it's a profitable exercise to try and rate claims as true or false. What we do think can make a difference is getting in early and being able to respond very quickly to claims as they're made, giving people the ability to see in context whether they're true or whether they're not true, and also understanding how claims spread and jumping in to how they spread to try to uh, stop the spread of claims that we can demonstrate aren't stacking up. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the tools we're building to make those tasks easier. So let me take you through what we as human beings, as fact checkers, do. Firstly, we're monitoring. We're a charity. We're committed to being nonpartisan. We're committed to being impartial. We have to make sure we're looking at a wide range of claims from a wide range of players in public debate. That can be everything from politicians to newspapers to celebrities. Then we have to spot claims. We actually have to recognize what is a factual claim and what's not. Then we have to work out for some value are true or not, whether they're true or not. Then we have to turn that into something you can publish. And then uniquely, full fact, almost uniquely, um, full fact among fact checkers, uh, goes and asks people to correct the record when they make mistakes. The idea is to stop the spread of unsubstantiated claims by getting the people who've made the mistake to correct them. Not because that will um, get everybody who's ever heard the claim to stop believing it. That's not how people work. But because people do work by things only really make a difference if we hear them lots of times. That's how political campaigning works. And so if you can stop something being repeated lots of times, you can reduce the damage that an inaccurate claim can do. So in terms of automating, the three areas we're currently working on where automation can help are monitoring, identifying new claims um, as quickly as possible, um, and then checking them. And I'll show you some of the tools we're building. Underlying these tools is one common engine, which is good at monitoring for claims, spotting claims, and checking claims. I think we're monitoring about 20 million sentences at the moment, and that's being added to uh, every single week. We're monitoring what's being said in Parliament. We're monitoring what's being said on TV. We're monitoring what's being said in newspapers. We're capable of monitoring social media. I don't think that's gone live yet. Um, but we're really looking to ingest the widest uh, realm of public debate that we can and ensure that we can understand how inaccurate and accurate claims spread and can be backed up. So 
this engine does two things. One is it uses the thousands of fact checks our human fact checkers have already done. It matters if people are repeating claims that have already been demonstrated to be true. That tells us something important about where to put our efforts. The second is it actually automatically checks new claims. So we've worked with the Office for National Statistics, the wonderful National Statistics Institute of the UK, um, which produces things like the employment figures, the immigration figures, the size of the economy figures. And we've um, been encouraging them to build an API for their data, which launched last year, which is getting more sophisticated week by week at the moment. And that's allowed us to suck in their data to automate some of our fact-checking process. So two tools, live and trends. Live is a live fact-checking tool. It identifies claims in real time, and it provides short verdicts or data for journalists and fact-checkers. Um, identifying claims in real time is something we've just done a research project on. Uh, what this is looking at is, can we start to not only work out whether something is a factual claim or not, but what kind of factual claim is it? And therefore, how would we go about tackling it and understanding whether it's true or not? So 90 wonderful, wonderful people helped us go back through the transcripts of a year's worth of political programs, things like BBC Question Time, and actually mark out what were factual claims that can be checked and what weren't. And in the factual claims, we find different kinds of claims. So quantities, correlation and causation, i.e. this caused that. Um, correlation and causation, my favorite one about that, um, you may have heard this before, but when ice cream eating goes up, shark attacks go up. Not because ice cream eating causes shark attacks, but because hot weather causes people to go swimming and people to eat ice cream. This is politicians' favorite fuzziness to swim around in. Two things are going in the same direction. One is them being elected. The other is something getting better in the world. They leave you to infer that there's a connection. There isn't always. Those kinds of claims buzz around public debate. Very, very important. What is the law? You know, do, do, um, you know, does the UK have the power to bomb Syria? Is that a legal thing to do? Very prominent factual claim at the moment. Um, predictions. Will leaving the EU make the economy better or worse? Probably the most prominent uh, prediction claim at the moment. And of course, uncheckable. Um, you can't, as we like to say, fact check the future. Nonetheless, this was a massive machine learning project fueled by volunteers helping us classify different kinds of claims. And that means that we can now ingest an entire program, but we're live fact-checking, and be told within seconds, OK, these look like the most prominent claims, the most um, useful areas for you to focus your attention, making our small team of fact-checkers far more productive. But this is what our fact-checkers are looking at during a program like that. Every week, we're live fact-checking checking Prime Minister's questions. Every week, we're live fact-checking BBC Question Time. So I or one of my colleagues will be sitting watching the program. Um, and this is what we'll see um, as the transcript goes by, as the program goes on. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing the text of what's being said in real time. I think this is a recording from Prime Minister's questions a few months ago. On the left-hand side, you have what they're saying being scraped off the television. Um, and on the right-hand side, as you can see, you have the factual claims that they are saying being identified in real time and flagged to us. So if there's a way of pausing this, yes, there is, you'll see that um, uh, we have the number of hospital beds fell by 25,000 in the last six years under the Labour government. Now, this is a fact check that we have previously done, our human fact checkers have previously done from our fact check database being matched in real time against that text. Underlying that, is a search engine, an, an off-the-shelf open source search engine. We're currently using Elasticsearch in very similar style to um, a media monitoring operation. What we're experimenting with at the moment is whether machine learning can do a better job of that kind of matching than search, and that contest is still running. So that's live, and that's helping us um, massively scale up the kind of work we do when we're live fact-checking. And take that out of um, our weekly work, which is kind of, let's face it, something that is more aimed at political geeks. Those programs aren't watched by everybody, and we'd be a very weird country if they were. But take you out of that context into an election time, when actually lots and lots of people are paying attention, because this is the one time we get to decide what we make of these people. When you get to an election, you get to the point where they've said everything they're going to say. 
they have a kind of bank of factual claims that they're going to make. And by the last TV debate of an election, fact checkers are kind of playing bingo. We have a pretty good idea of what, fact, what claims they're going to make during a debate. We don't know when, and we don't know in what order, but we pretty much know what to expect. And so a tool like Live can help us fact check a debate like that far more efficiently. So during those types of debates, we usually team up with the BBC or ITV or Sky, one of the big broadcasters, um, go to their studio and actually help them get their coverage right and help them explain to their viewers what we're doing. That depends on a huge amount of expertise from our team at the moment, but soon we hope to put these tools directly in the hands of those broadcasters so that instead of just having to rely on their general knowledge and what they can dig up in the middle of frantically trying to produce a very complex political program, they can actually have this information at their fingertips in real time in the editing booth. And that will help our journalists question the powers that be far more effectively. Let me show you something a bit more far-fetched. We turned up to a Facebook hackathon um, and, uh, for journalists with this API in our pocket, with the live tool in our pocket. And we worked on that day with the Facebook team to look at, OK, well, could you integrate this into Facebook Live? Here are the results. Her government said removing funding for nurses' bursaries would create an extra 10,000 training places in this parliament. Has this target been met? Prime Minister! There are, there are 10,000 more training places available for nurses in the NHS. But the, the right honourable gentleman talks about the amount of money that is being spent on the National Health Service. It is this Conservative government that is putting the extra funding into the NHS. And I remind the right honourable gentleman... It I'm, just is gonna, this oh, come back. I'm just going to come back to this. Um, warning first. If you were to produce a product like this for the public, it would have to be right and it would have to be perfect every time. We are not at the moment remotely suggesting that it would be reasonable for us to automatically publish fact checks into the middle of a live political debate because the risk of giving people something wrong or unreliable would be unfair and would not live up to our standards of objectivity and impartiality and balance. Um, but you can begin to see how you could at least suggest these options to TV producers and say, OK, well, you could split screen. You could, could put this stuff up together. When we did, um, I think it was the 2014 party conferences, we worked with Sky News. And when the party leaders were all giving their speeches, they actually split screened the speeches, where on the one half was the politician talking, and on the other half was graphs and stats and facts to contextualize what they were saying and, if necessary, contradict it. Now, that was, at that time, an almost impossible manual job. You can begin to see how this might become an option as long as you keep some human decision-making in the loop to make sure that what you're doing is fair, is actually in the context of a debate. Because underlying this, you have to remember, is fairly simple matching of, I recognize this claim. That's fine, but claims can appear in lots and lots of different contexts. And depending on the context they appear in, your product could be fair and useful, or actually quite dangerous. So that's um, live, and that's where live could go um, in, in its kind of next incarnation as a public tool. Let me quickly talk to you about robo-checking. This is, if you like, taking live to the next stage. Um, and we actually um, have a demo here. This is from a BBC Click episode. GDP is rising. It's kind of like... Oh, come back. GDP is rising. It's kind of like Shazam for facts. So what you've got there is speech recognition. Um, very simple. You know, you've all used those kinds of APIs, or expect a lot of you have. We're firing off that audio, getting speech, speech text back, and then we're recognizing, OK, that's a claim of a type full fact knows how to understand. And actually, it's a claim that if a human fact checker was fact checking it, would be treated fairly mechanically. We know where the GDP statistics come from. There is only one authoritative source of GDP statistics, which is released in three different editions, which is very complicated, but nonetheless, there's basically one source. We know how to deal with it. If a human fact checker was looking at this, they would see the claim, go and get that spreadsheet, find out whether it was rising or not, come back, probably with a graph, because we like graphs. Um, and a computer can do all of that. 
That's a fairly mechanical process. A computer is capable of doing it. There are lots and lots of claims that a computer will never be capable of fact-checking, or at least not until we sort of crack general artificial intelligence. What we've recognized is that there are lots of types of claims where the checking is actually more mechanical. And if you combine the fact-checking expertise we have with the um, technical expertise that we've recently added to our team, you can work out which of these things are automatable and apply it to get products like that. So now you can think that instead of just having to wait till we've got TV subtitles and wait till we've got claims in our database, we can actually create whole classes of claims that can be fact-checked automatically. And then finally, what do you do with all of this? It's ready now. That's my colleague Meevan, who's actually doing all of this work. Public figure. Um, but hey, um, so finally, the second tool I talked about, Trends. Trends is a monitoring tool. It allows us to see who is repeating inaccurate information and allows us to target our corrections work for maximum impact. Let me show you what that looks like. So this is a claim that nurses are using food banks. Um, and as you can see, that spike here, this is May 2017, so it's general election. Spiked massively in the general election, big controversy around there. Um, and what this trends tool is showing us is two things. One is, how big a claim is this? Where, where is it spreading? How far is it spreading? How long is it lasting? As you can see, big topic during the election drifted off after that. And it's also giving us a list of where it's being said and who it's being said by, which matters a great deal. There are some claims. I remember one, one of the first claims we looked at, half of the people making that claim about a black hole in the defense budget, half of those people was one person a guy called Lord Forsyth, which means that if you can just take him out for, for a lovely lunch and persuade him that that's not a helpful thing to do and explain that there's no basis for the claim, then you can massively reduce the spread of that claim. And that's what Trends is about. It's about taking our corrections work and actually making sure it's targeted and scalable and then evaluating its effectiveness, seeing what difference it actually makes. So none of this is creating that ultimate truth labeling application we talked about that um, automatically sorts claims into true and false, gets rid of human judgment and all the complexity of real life and all the context you need to know to make sense of things. What it is is about identifying all the effort, all the repeated work that goes into making sense of public debate when it can take days to fact check a claim reliably and actually simplifying that, cutting out what Andrew Ng calls the mental drudgery. Um, and actually helping us put our valuable fact checkers time in the places where it makes the most difference. So that's what we're building. The big lessons are, are two. One is that we can make fact checking dramatically more effective using new technology. The other is that humans are gonna be around for a while yet, and that you as voters ultimately are the people who have to make your minds up what to trust. Um, I've been full fact, you've been lovely. You haven't heckled once, but if you have any questions, comments, um, then please throw them at me. Okay, questions. Okay, we'll start with you at the front. Hey, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, so did, did you say that uh, we can watch the PMQs, like, say, on your website with constant fact-checking it, or...? All of these tools are only internal at the moment, so they're being used currently in three places. One is our own office, the other is um, Africa Check, which is a network of fact-checking organizations across Africa just beginning to use it, and the other is Chequeado in Argentina, um, who are an absolutely excellent fact-checking organization out there. Um, so one of the things we committed to do when we started building these tools was think global and not just think in terms of English. And so uh, Chequeado are brilliant partners because they're Spanish language, um, and we were using these tools to help them cover their State of the Union address. Our next release um, will be to journalists in newsrooms, and we're hoping to do that by the end of the year, get beta testers in newsrooms. The idea being that journalists don't need a perfect product. What they need is a product that shortcuts the work that they themselves have to do. When we are confident of the level of reliability of the tools, um, we will think about creating public products, but at the moment, these aren't public betas. Okay, cool. And uh, another question. So is it currently you're just focusing on UK facts or you, is the plan to kind of expand out globally as well? 
Um, well, as I said, this is about marrying technical expertise and fact-checking expertise. So um, we're now in three countries, three continents, I suppose, um, and Africa Check are using it to monitor claims in Africa. Chequeado will be using it to monitor claims in Argentina. Um, but both of them are providing the local expertise into what the issues of public debate are. I think in the longer term, there are, you can look at public debate in two ways. Lots of it is deeply local. And to be fair and balanced, you have to understand that political context, that media context, that culture. Um, and actually, more and more of it is crossing borders. So if you talk about the debate about vaccines and anti-vaccination activism and that sort of thing, that is very clearly a cross-border debate where lots of information is spreading online. So I think there's more of a role for sort of what you might call internet-scale fact-checking, which this is looking towards. But our commitment um, in the technical side is to think global and to think about those applications, but our ultimate commitment is to do so in a fair, balanced, objective way, and we'll need to be very careful about what the implications of expanding beyond the political culture we understand are. I would love to see you do that at a, a Trump campaign rally. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. It um, uh, was very um, insightful. Um, my question is, um, if you analyze claims, um, you deal with situations where you have um, a very straightforward fact-checking, which is GDP, for example. If you get a number wrong, you get a number wrong, and you can easily point it out. Yeah. But um, how do you deal with um, claims that are a little bit more disputable, um, where you have numbers that could be um, interpreted in different ways, depending yeah. on the context? Um, how do you um, deal with that, and how do you point it out in your analysis? Um, that's an absolutely great question. And actually, GDP is rising as a perfect example of that. Let's say that GDP this quarter is higher than last quarter, but is lower than a year ago, but is higher than when this government came into power. Is GDP rising or not? Is the economy growing or not? And it's kind of completely reasonable to take different answers to that view. Now, if you believed in the truth labeling task as the goal of this project, you'd be screwed. You would have to decide that one version of that was true or false, or you just call it neither true nor false, which is a useless label. Um, our job as fact checkers is to make things as simple as they can be, but not simpler. So the answer in that case is, here it is. This is what's happening. It's largely been going up, but actually it dropped in the last month. And you know, whatever it might be. And the task for us, the real skill for us at that point, is finding ways to simplify that information into the amount of time that people want to spend trying to understand it. So, you know, sometimes it may just be a case of saying, look, it's not that simple. You know, it's been wobbling around a bit. The truth is it's really flat, whatever it might be. But the rule in my world, I do a lot of radio, a lot of TV doing kind of communicating our fact checking. And basically the rule is if the first half a sentence isn't interesting, then people won't listen to the end of a sentence. If you don't have a good first sentence, you don't get 30 seconds. If you don't get a good 30 seconds, you don't get three minutes. <clears throat> and you never, ever, ever get more than three minutes. So dealing with complexity involves putting real effort into simplifying things. And right at the beginning, I showed the stages of a fact-checking process that um, can and can't be automated at the moment. Um, and you, this is why we pull out publish as a separate stage. Actually working out, OK, we know what the data says, but how do we turn that into an answer that's actually useful for people is a wholly different skill. And one of the things I'm hoping is that as we identify more and more types of claims, we can find actually there are almost templates of ways of presenting answers that are helpful to people based on this type of claim can be presented this way. But that's, you know, that's a line of thinking for the future. But basically, it's hard. And you have to remember that your job is to empower people to make their own minds up, not tell them what to think. Any more? OK, two. It's a great organization. Can you tell me a bit more about though, what the barriers are to doing this online with Twitter and all the other places where there seems to be a fair amount of falsehood at the moment? Um, great question. I mean, one is just sheer scale, right? So the level of processing you would need to do there is massive. That's not impossible. Um, one is principle. Um, there is social media, I think, is doing something new 
in that the same platform which is used by organizations and powerful individuals as effectively a broadcast platform is exactly the same platform that you and I use to talk to our friends in what we consider to be private conversations. And there are many, many fuzzy points on the scale between the two. I, for one, am not signing up to the idea that everybody's private conversations should be subject to monitoring to check that they're true or not and interventions. So, so we have to be really, really careful when we think about that kind of thing as to what principles are, we're applying and what red lines we want to hold to. So when we are thinking about monitoring Facebook, for example, what we're thinking about is monitoring the Facebook accounts of organizations with a level of accountability, things like political parties. And I'm completely comfortable with that. They should be held to account. I would not be comfortable with applying that on large scale to social media in the same way. But actually, you're looking at early stage technology. We need to prove that it works first and then work out where to scale it up and what the social implications and applications of that are. So, the thing I, I would always urge, and we're spending a lot of time talking about this debate at the moment, I am much, much, much more concerned about being lied to by somebody in a position of power over me or misled accidentally, let alone on purpose, by somebody in a position of power, be they a major media outlet or the prime minister or the leader of the opposition, than I am about somebody being wrong on the internet. It's a free country. People will always be wrong about things. That's not the end of the world. Um, but actually, people in positions of power, all of us as citizens need ways of being able to judge their claims. So that would be my priority. But yeah, the technology is taking us interesting places, but we haven't got there yet. So it's a pretty simple question, kind of connected. In your trends uh, graph, the, the hits, are they weighed by any kind of impact factor or just a... Not at this how stage. How far do you scrape as well? Um, in, interesting area to get into, but not at this stage. Um, just a quick question about the last bit, the follow-up. Have you got an example where you've actually followed up and managed to actually correct? Oh, yeah. Um, so I got an email um, a couple of days ago. On, we did a bunch of fact-checking on mental health. There was a big row between an actor from the royal family called Ralph Little and the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, about the quality of mental health provision in this country. And um, we fact-checked loads of their claims. It took weeks and weeks and weeks. It was really hard. Um, since then, the Department of Health has commissioned a survey that wasn't going to be repeated um, based on our work. We've had NHS England have to write to the Health Select Committee to clarify the source of some claims they made to the Health Select Committee, and then we pointed out that what they said was wrong, so they had to have another go at that. Um, and we had like half a dozen kind of impacts like that. So it's quite routine for us to seek corrections and get people to correct the record. When we started back in 2010, that was really surprising to people. So we would write to a media outlet or a politician and say, you've made a mistake, you need to correct the record. And they would say, who are you and why are you bothering us? And we've had to win the argument that responsible people in public life correct the record when they make mistakes. And we are still having to win that argument day by day. But we have had... David Cameron, when he was prime minister, stand up in the House of Commons and say, the honorable lady should listen to full fact and um, you know, tell her, the, a Labour MP, that she was wrong about something. And then three months later, we had him formally correcting the record on something he said in the House of Commons. And that's important. It has to happen on both sides of the aisle, and it has to be respected on both sides of the aisle. But yes, serious people in politics and journalism, like our cross-party board of trustees, think that politics and journalism are important and deserve to be done well. And for that reason, you know, often we can convince them to correct the record when they need to. Not always, and we're working on that. Uh, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, so fact-checking may be a very lonely place, <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. So I'm not sure there are many organizations like you out there. Do you work together? Do you... Yeah, so um, <laughs> that's a lovely way of putting it. I suppose what I would like to think is that it's becoming a less lonely place. Um, over the last year, the BBC have spun up BBC Reality Check. It's in-house fact-checking organization, which used to pop up mainly at elections and referendums, has become a permanent 
exercise. I'm really pleased to see that coming out. Channel 4 has run a fact check blog for a number of years. We're the only fact checkers who are independent of the media as well as politics and who are going for corrections, not just publishing fact checks in the UK. And I think that's very important. There are another couple of organizations, Fact Check NI in uh, Northern Ireland, and there's a uh, nascent, um, I forget, I think it's called the Ferret Fact Service in Scotland, um, which has the coolest name. Um, so there is, you know, this is a time when people are worried about being bullshitted. And there are more and more people willing to call that out and to challenge it. And I think that's a very important thing. What I think, though, is it shouldn't just be down to fact checkers who call themselves fact checkers. It's actually really important that experts of every stripe are willing to stand up when their own field of expertise is being misrepresented. And a room full of people who know about data and know about data science and know about AI and probably know about things like encryption, that means you guys. How much nonsense have we heard in public debate recently about encryption, about what data can and cannot do? If people with real expertise aren't standing up, you know, writing to your MP and saying, I saw you said this, and that doesn't make sense, what did you actually mean? Then we're not going to have a healthy democracy. So it's not just a thing for organizations, it's a thing for all of us. And what I hope is that full fact is giving more people the encouragement and maybe the tools to do more of this work. OK, we've got time for two or three more questions. OK. How do you avoid bias in your, uh, with your funding? Um, there is no such thing, one of my trustees said to me early on, there is no such thing as funding that everyone see, will see as completely neutral. I think one of our leading funders for years has been the Nuffield Foundation, who funds social science research, and they are about as you know, clean cut as you could possibly hope for a funder to be. But actually the answer is you have to have a very broad range of funding. So we have funding everything from members of 38 Degrees, the left-wing campaigning online community, to blue chip companies like Rolls-Royce and St. James's Place. We have had funding from the City of London. We've, uh, uh, we were originally funded, we, we started with two funders. One was our chairman, Michael Samuel, he's a businessman. Um, he used to be a conservative donor, wonderful man. He's um, supported us ever since Full Fact was just an idea right till now and from the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust, um, which would be seen as kind of left-leaning. Um, and it's about, if nobody will accept any source of money as completely untainted, then you just have to show you have breadth, and that's what we've always tried to do. If you want to help us with that, what we'd really like to be funded by is you guys, fullfact.org slash donate. We have about 500 people at the moment giving us about 10 pounds a month. The more people do that, the more genuine independence we can demonstrate from all kinds of interests, because the smaller the average donation in some ways, the better off we are in terms of our independence. So that's, that's how you can help that answer. Um, so you can also give us more money. That's completely fine. <laughs> Hi, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, question on the tech side. You said for checking that you're using Elasticsearch. Could you elaborate quickly uh, a little bit the tech text, the text stack that you use to do the spotting, especially uh, live? The Elasticsearch stuff specifically. Can't hear you. On the, on the spot side, I guess you're not using Elasticsearch. Elastic yeah. No, no, that's um, literally that's Elasticsearch at the moment. So um, un underneath Elasticsearch, um, Elasticsearch has a component called Percolator, um, which is a real-time, effectively streaming, um, I forget quite what the term is, but basically Percolator and its solar equivalent, LUAC, which is a freestanding project maintained by an open source company called Flax, who are search specialists who've been really supportive of us, um, both do the same basic idea, which is, Instead of running one query against lots of documents, run one document, in our case, one single sentence, against lots of queries. And so deal with a whole stream of sentences very, very quickly. Um, so we are basically running our searches through Percolator in real time, uh, running our sentences through Percolator in real time against custom handwritten query terms for each of the fact checks in our database. So that means that the optimization point for making our fact checking our spotting more accurately is better handwritten search terms. We know that can be done to a high standard. I, I don't have a precision of recall figures on me, but they're pr pretty high. That's, I think, I, I'm really sorry, I can't quote them authoritatively off the top of my head, but 70s, 80s is the area we're aiming for and I think hitting. Um, 
we know that we can do that to a reasonably high standard, and that's regularly done in media monitoring. But because of the precision of the way language is used in fact-checking, we need to think very carefully about how we optimize that. And that's why we're experimenting with machine learning and creating custom models per claim as an alternative approach. And basically, it's a simple question. What works better? That's an empirical question. But underlying it at the moment is search. Does that answer your question? In politics. Hi. Hi. Uh, what's in politics? What's the role of the uh, civil servants for fact checking? Civil servants? Yes. Oh, you lovely, lovely man. Um, are you a civil servant yourself? No, no, I'm not. But, okay, uh, right. Um, so, several things. Um, one is the more public data is available in re reusable formats, the more it can be incorporated into groundbreaking tools like these ones. And we can start experimenting with how we can use it to prop up public debate with high quality information at the speed which public debate now happens in. So the Office for National Statistics, having pioneered putting their statistics into a machine readable API, are now going to the next step, which is how do we put the caveats in a machine readable format that you can use yourself? So let me take the murder rate over the last 20 years, right? There is a massive spike in 2002-03, I think, from memory. Um, not because there was a massive number of murders, but because Harold Shipman's murders were all booked in that year. Now, if you don't know that fact about the homicide figures, there is no way you can reach sensible conclusions about what they mean, be you a machine or be you a human being. What the Office for National Statistics is now doing is thinking, how do, how do we encode that kind of information in machine-readable ways? So we need to be having really smart conversations about this isn't just about data. It's about the information you need to understand and reuse data and making that machine readable and pioneering that. But there is another conversation that public servants need to be having, which is that we have seen the commercial sector begin to reinvent itself around real-time, individual-level, transaction-level data like Tesco Club Card and all of that kind of jazz. We know that the public sector is about to reinvent huge parts of its infrastructure due to Brexit. We're going to have to build new systems for lots of different things like border controls and stuff like that, you would imagine. We have an opportunity now to think about what kind of information do we want out of those systems in order to be able to ask more intelligent questions in future about how our country works and how we want it to be able to work. At the moment, so much of the information we have as a country is based on a survey done once a year that we hope is representative, but even if it is representative, it takes a hell of a long time to do could be a hell of a lot faster, could get down to much more local granular level than it currently does. We don't have that richness of information that would allow us to stop flying blind in areas like crime, in areas like immigration, in areas even in some cases like health. So we should be putting pressure and saying there is a much better class of decision making we could be doing if we weren't flying blind quite so often. And I think civil servants need to be banging that drum really loudly. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in terms of questions. I'm sorry to those of you who had questions that we weren't able to get, get around to. Um, feel free to collar Will afterwards. I'll be um, because you did leave early the last time you did this. I, I, I'll hang around, I'll hang around, yeah. I'll be at the back. And um, I had to field his questions and I couldn't answer any of them. Um, so yes, so thank you. Round of applause for Will. Thank you very much.